First of all, good morning. And uh, perhaps you have your seatbelts tightened for the things that we're going to share this morning. Uh, I just feel so uh, humbled and, uh, and honored to be a part of a congregation that uh, allows for uh, freedom of thought and the ability to uh, really study the scriptures, see whether or not things are true. That's our heritage in the uh, Restoration Movement. Better known, by the way, as the American Reformation. Our forefathers, a couple of hundred years ago, always said that we stand on the shoulders of giants, particularly talking about people like Martin Luther, talking about people like John Calvin and many others, that they felt it was a continuation of the Reformation uh, that they had begun, but that it was incomplete. And much of what I have to say uh, uh, this morning, they would agree with 200 years ago. 200 years ago, what I'm teaching this morning was a part of, if I had to take a number of percentage, about 95% of all of the churches, including the Presbyterians, the Baptists, uh, various and, su and uh, sundry other uh, pilgrim uh, type groups, all with the exception of the Methodists. Uh, today, it seems difficult in our hearing. Part of it was the advent of democracy rather than uh, living in a country in which there was sovereign rule. The sovereignty of God uh, is something that uh, may seem a little bit foreign to our ears. We're not used to having a sovereign. Uh, some of you who uh, may think of uh, Barack Obama that way, uh, it's a far cry from the, the kind of uh, a sovereign uh, that uh, the Bible is talking about. Okay. Clicker. Uh, just like last week, let's begin with a congregational prayer. Uh, several of you asked for the copy of the one last week, and I'd be glad to send it to you via email. And I would like for you, if you choose to, to uh, say it with me before we begin our lesson. Our Father, we honor you today as a congregation of your people. You have adopted us into your kingdom, not just as servants, but as sons and friends. Forgive us for thinking that we first chose you. In your holy word, you have taught us that you chose us, that we love you because you first loved us. Your only son, Jesus, has opened the door to you by dying for us and then being raised from death in the grave, securing our everlasting salvation. We ask, therefore, that you open our ears and hearts this morning to all of the precious and glorious truths about you found in the gift of your eternal word. In Jesus' holy name, we ask. Amen. Remember last week's mantra uh, when we talked about faith and the kind of faith that the Bible talks about that saves. And we, if you recall, I said that uh, a part of the, the, the five ones of the Reformation uh, was that we're saved by faith alone, through, Christ, uh, through grace alone, because of Christ alone. And what we're talking about today is the doctrine of God's grace as presented in the, in the Bible, especially in the New Testament uh, scriptures. In Romans 9, which I think Larry read so effectively, uh, there are some scholars who think that uh, Romans 9 through 11 were written uh, after uh, he had written uh, all the previous uh, chapters before and after. I don't know if I agree with that totally, but I can understand it. Guess what is the second most favorite verse in the Bible? The first one, of course, is what? John 3, 16, which we'll talk about a little bit later. The second one is which one? In Romans 8. You remember? 828. We know that for everything God works for good with those who love him and who are called according to his purposes. We have heard that, at least I've heard it, all of my life. 
just about, and especially since I went to college at Abilene Christian, and I say amen to it. But how often have we heard the immediate follow-up verses, which, by the way, some scholars believe it caused some misunderstanding with the Romans, therefore 9, 10, and 11 had to be written. This is what it said, and by the way, the assignment last week was what? To read Romans 8, 17 through chapter 9. I hope you did it. How many of you did it? Raise your hands. Okay. Well, here's what it says. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is commonly known as the golden chain. It immediately follows verse 28. So what do we see here? We see that in this golden chain, these things. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed in the image of his son. Also, that he, those who were predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also did what? Justification, and that's what the end result of faith is about. We want to be justified before God. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And then a little bit later, he would add, well, who can lay any charge to God's elect? It is God who justifies. If God justifies you, who can condemn you? Who can criticize you? We're God's people. We're God's elect. And you can see how some scholars can say, well, uh, that explains why he has to be very specific in Romans 9. Now, in that little room over there in the corner, Larry and I spent two years going through Romans. And if I remember right, Romans 9, 10, and 11 took almost a half a year to go through it. So I'm just going to point out a couple of things. And believe it or not, we're going to spend most of our time in John, which I believe to be the most evangelistic gospel of all. If you have, your, have a, a pencil or a paper, take your bullet and write some notes, it doesn't matter uh, that you believe what Steve Molnar teaches or Chris Beard teaches or anybody else, any of the elders. If the Word is not your own, if you haven't come under the Word of God yourself, there's an old saying in education, is there any difference between someone who can't read and somebody who won't read? There's no difference whatsoever, is there? It's the same thing here. If you won't read it, if it's not yours, you're going to believe almost anything that comes by. So make it your own. Study it for yourself. I want to point out a couple of things as we, we go through Romans, a, a little bit of Romans 9. Note these passages in verses 10 and 11. And not only so, but also Rebecca. When she had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of what? His call. It's the same word call that he uses in Romans 8. The point of this is it's not, wasn't dependent on Isaac being a great righteous person, in fact, if you study his life, uh, he's not. He's not at all. It's somebody that was chosen simply because of God's election. Forget this business of God calling nations or God predestin predestining nations. It doesn't say that. It talks about uh, people. And as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau... I have hated. Then in verse 14 and 15, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, quoting from the Old Testament, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Then going a little bit later, he uses Pharaoh 
as an example, the, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. And I want to remind you that in verse 18, as we read 18, so then he had mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens the heart of whomever he wills. It's not as though he took a pure, innocent young man who became the Pharaoh and created fresh evil or fresh uh, unrighteousness in him. He took someone who was unrighteous already. And remember how Paul earlier in the book would say, all have done what? Sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none that does righteousness. No, not one. We'll come back and allude to that a little bit later. And then in verse 19, why does he still find fault? You will say to me, why does he still find fault? Who can resist his will? But who are you, a man, to answer back to God? Will the molded say to the molder or the potter say to the, the pot say to the potter, why have you made me like this? One of the reasons I've come to the conclusion that the, the stress ought to be, in the ways that we'll discuss a little bit later, on the sovereignty of God, if in your salvation, if you're coming to faith, if you're coming to righteousness, that there is an island of righteousness, if there's a bastion of, of goodness so that God will justify you on that basis. You have no argument here. You shouldn't have any argument. Because if it's on you, you wouldn't be able to say exactly what the Scripture says. Why does he then still have fault? Of course he'd find fault if he finds uh, uh, some bastion of righteousness in me. You get it? And let's go a little bit further. Has the pot no right over the clay? My roommate in college, Avery Faulkner, who was later a professor of art at Pepperdine College, I remember how he, used to, he was a sculptor, and I remember how he would work on a piece of art. And I would go, and he'd be working, and I'd say, man, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And he'd just bum the back up and make another old big ball of clay, and he'd start all over again. And the point is this, that God is never satisfied until his artwork, his building, is what he wants it to be. But one thing can never happen. The clay can never come back up and say to Avery, Avery, I don't like the way you made me. I don't like, the, I don't like this at all. I was just a very happy little clump of clump of clay here and look what you've done to me. Never would happen. And this is Paul's point. Uh, it reminds me, doesn't it, uh, you, of Job. After all of the suffering and all of the, the stuff that he went through toward the end of the book, uh, he's searching for answers from God. You know, why did all of the suffering happen? Did God ever tell him? No. He didn't tell him at all. He talks about the Leviathan, he talks about where were you when the heavens were made? Where were you when all of this took place in eternity? He never gives an answer. And that is exactly where we are, our position should be with God, in trust. Remember last week when we talked about the chair? It's one thing to believe the facts, it's another thing to ascend to those facts, but it's a completely different thing to trust to trust in God, not to just believe in him, but to trust him. And so Romans 9, and I suggest to you, if you obviously many of you did not read it, you read it for yourselves and see the uh, conclusions uh, that you draw. But this is not a lesson particularly about the book of Romans, although I think it is the, the clearest uh, 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 book and describing it. I want to add to, by the way, in the book of Ephesians, here's this young church, and in the first chapter, read it for yourselves, of all the things that he could have talked to, he could talk about their pagan ways, he could talk about uh, Jesus Christ and his crucifixion and so forth, which he does later. But he talks about how they were predestined, they were predestined, they were chosen by God. Again, 
Ephesians 1. Read it for yourself. But John, I think, is the most evangelistic uh, of all of the Gospels. In shorthand form, uh, you remember uh, the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke? We used to hear uh, or be taught in uh, Bible 101 that uh, Mark was written to the Romans, Matthew predominantly to the Jews, right, and Luke to the Greeks, uh, to bring about the history, to talk about the coming of Christ, his, his genealogy, all the things that he did to, especially in the case of Matthew, to talk about his parables and the things that he talked, the Sermon on the Mount. But the Gospel of John is different. John is the evangelistic gospel that was written some years later. It has a unique focus, and what I want you to lock into your brain as we, we, we study this, that the Gospel of John especially is on two tracks. It's on two tracks. We're going to talk about the first track first. John then presents the Gospel in a, in a very breathtaking way. Just the very first words, the very first verse in chapter 1, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Other translations have it something like, what the Word was, God was, and what God was, the Word was. And then later on, it talks about uh, the Word becoming flesh. And so from the get-go, it's saying that what I am telling you about from the very beginning has to do, when we look at the Word, we're studying the doctrine of God. We're studying about how God uh, is bringing people to faith. And then we talk, we can talk about the seven I am's. Uh, I am what? I am the resurrection and the life. Now, you can imagine any human being, any teacher, regardless of how good they are, any preacher, regardless of how eloquent they may be, getting up and saying, I, am the way, the truth, and the life. The first reaction would be he's lost his mind. I am the bread of life. You have to eat me. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. These verses are universal. They're pointing to Jesus. They're pointing to the one through whom everything was made, according to John 1. Uh, who among us could say what Jesus did in John? Which one of you convicts me, will convict me of sin? I, I venture to say, you didn't go very far into this morning before sinning in some way, in mind or thought or action, omission or commission. If you're, if you're a person that has any rationality, you have sinned already today. But he could say, how many of you convict me of sin? And so in track one, there's the free offer of the gospel. And most of the verses that we associate with the gospel message comes from this track. For example, at the very beginning or toward the end of the book, John talks about the reason for the writing of the book. Jesus did many other signs because the book is full of signs and wonders and miracles, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing that you may have life in his name. Remember last week, we talked about the facts of faith. Remember that? It's trying to get people to ascend to those facts of faith. When you read the Holy Scripture, that's its purpose. We're going to come back to this when we talk about how this immediately impacts you. But your responsibility is to know those facts, to help people like the Illmans, help people to, like they do, to help them to, people to ascend to those facts and that's where your responsibility ends, as you'll see in a little while. For example, in John 1 and 12, 
but to what? To all who receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Could there be a broader statement than that? He came to his own home, his own people received him not. His very own family, for the most part, rejected him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the power to become, or the right to become, the children of God. How about this? If John 8, 28 is the second favorite, this you see it any, almost any time you watch a football game. There's somebody in the stands with John 3.16 on him. For God so loved the world. How more expansive could that be? He loved the world so much that he gave, literally in the Greek, his one and only son. I like the King James. The whosoever, whoever believes in him. Can there be any more anything more universal than that? This, this plea for people to come and to believe and be saved, to come to Jesus and to know him and to be saved by him, and the message, you will not perish, but you'll have eternal life. And that eternal life is mentioned here and in other places in John. He's very good at it. It's a condition that a believer is consistently and continually in and never stops. It's not that we go to eternity. Eternity lives in us. What about John 4, 14? Again, but whoever, this is what? The woman at the well. After meeting her, a woman who had had five husbands and she was lying about the man she was sleeping with now. Right? This is what he says to her. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. What a promise. What a promise. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up again to eternal life. The invitation is right there. Come. Come to me. Drink. Take it in. And when you do, by the way, talking about the Holy Spirit, it will well up in you into eternal life. What a wonderful invitation. She ran back to her village, and she told everybody what? I've seen the Christ. I've met the Messiah. What about this one? It's truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word, and believes him who sent me, again, has eternal life. You own it. It's yours. He does not come into judgment, but passed from death to life. The vision I have of it, God only knows I'm full of sin because I'm in Christ. I don't even have to go through the judgment, the judgment described. Isn't that what it says? You've already passed if you're a Christian now and a believer, you've already passed from death into life. I miss one. John 6, 29, Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Whoever, any of you in this audience, I know most of you, I don't know your hearts, but I know most of you, but whoever or whosoever comes to me, I will never cast out. What an invitation to come, believe, repent, believe, and, 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 and join Christ in his family and be saved. The sovereign God has invited us, all of us, to be saved, to believe in Christ and to be his. But there's another track. There's a track, and I want you to be honest with me and be honest with yourself. In your experience, in most of your church life, we have heard the first track over and over and over again. But we very rarely hear about the second track, and that track is the sovereignty of God and salvation, which is our predominant subject, isn't it? 
What does sovereign mean, anyway? We don't use it because uh, we, we talk about uh, the sovereign state of Texas. Sometimes when I do a wedding ceremony, I, 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 I pronounce you man and wife uh, according to the right given me by the sovereign state of Texas and so forth and so on. What does it mean? It means absolute, supreme, ultimate, unrestricted, unconditional. There are many, many seeming contradictions in the Bible. And if you think of what we're going to say next, I want you to think of it this way. Let me ask you a question. Who wrote the book of Romans? Did God write it or did Paul write it? Did Paul write it or did God write it? The answer is what? Yes. Somebody said it. Well, yes. Now try to explain that to a Muslim. Even more so. God is one. Right? Try to explain to a Jew or to a Muslim. Yes, but he's three persons. He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, wait a minute, that's three, if I do my math right. You said he's one, now you're throwing at me that he's three. Seems, like I said, it's a seeming contribution. Uh, uh, not a contribution, contradiction. What about this one? The last council argued this for weeks. The council of Cal Chalcedon, the last council that we term a legitimate council on the outskirts of what is now Istanbul to argue, is, is Jesus fully God or is Jesus fully man? Which one? Both. He's, we know that. We, we've been in Sunday school. The answer is yes, but try to explain that sometimes to a non-believer. There are many contradictions like that in the Holy Scripture. And the same is true here. On one hand, on one track, we have human responsibility. And then on the other track, we have God's sovereignty and salvation. We have God's authority. When I said, by the way, we have man's responsibility, I'm not talking about man's ability. We don't have within ourselves the ability to come to God on our own. The verses that you read that are so familiar, the key element is this. When you were dead in your sins. Forget this business of a bastion of righteousness that, yeah, God did his 99.99%, but that 1% that goes after that bastion of righteousness. And the examples I've heard, uh, you're in the pool, you're drowning, you have no chance of survival, but there's a lifeline thrown to you. You still have to grab it and come up. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches you're dead. You're rigor mortis in the bottom of the pool. You're Lazarus. You stink. You've been in the grave four days. And when our, we're out there preaching the gospel, we're preaching to Lazarus all the time. When you were dead in your sins... God made us alive together. It's God's sovereign grace. It's God's sovereign will. And then he goes on to say what? By faith, you have been saved through grace. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. So let's look at the track. Uh, that uh, John goes in. John 6, 37. All, did I miss one? Let's go back. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whosoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Does that sound familiar? It ought to, because we just said it on the first track, the second part of it. 
But the Father, God, is always previous in salvation. And the picture John paints is that people come and they are a gift that God is giving to his son Jesus. That's the picture that he has. Even in John 17, when he prays uh, he, uh, that, that final prayer before going to the cross, I do not pray for the world. That within itself seems like a contradiction. God so loved the world, he said, I do not pray for the world, but I pray for those that you have given me that they may be with me. How about this in John 10? I am the good shepherd. Good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, the sheep hear my, his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. There are others that will come, but they won't listen. The sheep won't listen to them because they're robbers and thieves. The question is, are you a sheep before or after you came to Christ? This is very similar, by the way, to the prophecy in John, I believe, the end of the 11th chapter after the raising of Lazarus, given the last prophecy given to a high priest, Caiaphas. What? He prophesied that there will be a gathering of the children of God spread all over the world. Do they even know about Christ? Do you remember the Macedonian call? God said to Paul, go there. I have many people there. These were the sheep. These are the ones who would hear his voice. How about John 15 and 16? You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. And here's the tough one. This one was so tough that most of the disciples left Jesus. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. There's some modern translations to take the word draw, draws him, and changes it to woo him. It doesn't work. It's the same word later in John. Remember when Jesus was walking on the beach after the resurrection, they caught no fish all night. Bobby knows what that's, that's like because he very rarely catches anything. But he said, well, cast your net over there. And so they did, and there were so many fish that they couldn't haul them in. Couldn't haul them in. This is the idea through history of the hound of heaven, never stopping until he seeks out his own, seeks out. God pictured that way, and about the time you think you're going to escape, C.S. Lewis would talk about on that bus in England in 1929 where God found him. This is the sovereign grace of God. And then this is in verse 65 of the same chapter. And he said, this is why after the apostles said, well, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? The disciples are leaving. This is why I told you that no one the no one in 44 and the no one in 65 is what is commonly known as the eternal negative. When I say to you that no one today in this audience is going to be able to see Silsby play in the championship next week, well, the main reason is that they didn't win. They're not in the championship. That means no one, no one. Well, wait a minute. This is a perfect time for John to say, yeah, but there are few really devout religious people who love me, who are, have an island of righteousness. No. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him or unless it is granted him. What does grant mean? It means a gift. Gift. 
The gift of what? By grace, if you've been saved through faith, it's not your own. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. So how do we reconcile these things? Think about it in your own mind. How many sermons have you heard or lessons have you heard in your Church of Christ, Christian Church, Baptist experience, whatever it is, in which the emphasis was on track two? How many? I would venture to say almost none, unless it was done in some way to explain it away. How do we reconcile? Charles Spurgeon said, I don't have to reconcile friends. Neil Punt and our very, very dear friend, Edward Fudge, who spoke here prior to the time that, uh, uh, that Chris came. And listen very carefully and, and, and write this down. If you don't, you'll miss it. Those who choose to repent and believe will experience it as though they made the decision in their own strength and by their own determination of will. But it is God who grants faith and repentance. And even though I don't like proof texts, these are two important ones. Acts 11.26, when Peter talked about the conversion of Cornelius, and the apostle said, oh, you mean that repentance has also been given or granted to the Gentiles? You see, if you've done something wrong, if you're unlawful, and, you know, you're sorry, you repent of it, you're going to change, you can do all of this. I don't want to go to jail. There's nothing you can do about it until your pardon is there. I don't understand a lot of it and how God works. I don't even understand how it works in human sense. Those of you around during the time of the Nixon administration remember clearly, I mean, he's banned from the office Charles Colson, among many others, Haldeman, they all went to jail. And who, who does Ford give a pardon to? Right? Somebody. You're as old as I am, most of you. Nixon. That's not fair, is it? It's not fair, is it? But in the sovereignty of the President of the United States, that's what happened. Also, 2 Timothy 2.25, a very important verse in this, and there are many others. So in other words, what it's saying, and I want to make this clear to you, I know most of you, I don't know all of you. If you've come to trust in Christ, I am going to assume, I always assume, you've done it because you're of the elect. It's very simple for me. I could have some doubts by the fruit or lack of fruit, but that's just my opinion. I'm not, none of us are in a position to judge anybody, are we? Okay, now, let's get down to the nitty-gritty. Why is this doctrine important? I said before it was a predominant view until the early 1800s. Campbell, there's the, the classic uh, creed, the Westminster Confession, and Campbell said, I agree with everything in it. I agree with everything in it, except for the section that had to do with the clergy. And that's why in our, in our history, in our tradition, we don't have a liturgical, uh, clerical, I mean, nobody, very few of us run around with clerical collars. We run around, I wore a suit today because I'm going to the funeral. We run around in jeans and whatever. Except for that, I agree with everything. But listen to this. This is what he also said. Nobody has ever been saved by a theory of justification. Nobody has ever been saved, and this is me, by a way of doing mission work. No one has ever been saved because somebody said, we you know, in the right church, I can prove it. I have a cornerstone that says 33 AD out front. Nobody. That was this, what I told you today, was the predominant view. And this is one of the blessings of democracy that we have the country that we have, but it's also the curse of a democracy. Faith in faith, remember that we talked about last week. 
It gives balance to the church, doesn't it? If there's track one and track two, it gives a balance to our preaching and to our teaching. I love this one, and I'm not going to expound on it because I start crying when I get in the middle of it. There is a sense of being elected and chosen and adopted that's important to me as a human being. When I was a kid, I told you about Edgewood Court, which was kind of the dead-end street next to where we grew up. And I was only 10 years old when we moved to New Jersey, and I was the youngest one on the block. And they would have a baseball game at 9, 9.30 in the morning, every summer morning. And they would pick the girls before me. And I remember the day. Steve, you join our team. There's something special about feeling that you're chosen. But even more importantly, it's so special to feel the, the sense of adopted. We use the term adopt in so many ways. We adopt a way of life. We adopt a cat. Of course, we adopt children. I went to Hungary, and some of you, if this is repetitive, so be it. I went to Hungary uh, when we were in the process of adopting Kelly. And I know Hungarian, conversational Hungarian pretty well. I did not know the word for adopt in Hungarian. And my cousin, I was trying to explain, I had a picture of little two-year-old Kelly. And, and she finally got it. And she said in Hungarian, Eric befogatuk. And I took it apart. I understood what those words meant. Forever I claim you as my own. That's what God has done. That's what the eighth chapter, especially, is about in the book of Romans. God has only one son, born of him. There's one and only son, Jesus. The rest of us have been adopted into the family. That's special. Any of you who have been adopted, and I don't know, some of you may have been, some of you have adopted kids. God is saying, forever, I hold you as my own. What else? There's only two things, and then we can go eat lunch. It stops any sense of boasting. Whether that boasting is that we've got the right doctrine, we've got the right church, we have the right order of worship. Uh, look what I, look, I don't know what these other people have done, but I know God's grace saves, but I was the one who made the final decision. It's me. I'm better than these others who heard the same message, but they didn't believe it. They didn't respond. Boasting. And I love the way that uh, Paul talks about this. Come on, baby, work. Uh, in, in 1 Corinthians, uh, the, ninth, uh, the, the very first chapter. When he talks about in the, in the sense that when I came to you, I didn't come in many, in mighty words of wisdom. I didn't come uh, with great eloquence. I didn't come with all of the wisdom of the high-born, of all the royalty in that society. I didn't do any of that stuff. Okay, Amazon, you're in trouble now. No more Christmas gifts from you. I want to read it exactly as it is because it's important. I'm, by the way, I have it on this one in the uh, New English version. This is what he says. The whole chapter is worth reading. Verse 26. For consider your what? Your calling. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, 
so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And then in verse 30, in the English, this translation has it correct. It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. Because of who? Come on, audience. It's because of God that you're in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, by the imputation of righteousness, sanctification and redemption, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, everybody, that's not too loud, come on, let anyone who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's what I'm trying to convey to you. Also, in, in Ephesians 2, it says the same thing. Lest any man should boast. The gift of faith has been given to you by God. The Holy Spirit pricking the heart through the preaching of the word so that you get beyond just ascending to the truth. But you believe it. You accept it. You make it your own. You treasure it. It's yours forever. And then lastly, and you're not going to believe this one, if in fact John is the most evangelistic of the Gospels, if it's the most evangelistic, I have a feeling it's going to help you with your own personal individual evangelism. And I'll tell you why I believe that. From what I see and what I experience, so many people are afraid to tell anybody about Christ because they think that it depends on your eloquence it depends on how well you do it. It depends on your knowledge base. But the early church, I mean, Chris is absolutely right about this. They were scattered in chapter 8 of Acts. And they went everywhere announcing the good news of Jesus. Most of these folks were illiterate. But they announced the good news of Jesus. And that's why Paul, after the section I just read, when I came to you, brothers, I did not pro come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty words of wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. When I look at the cross, I see two things. I see the horror, the terror, the filth, the separation from God. That's what it took for you and for me to be justified. And on the other hand, I also see the beauty of the cross. I see the holiness of the cross. I see the blessings of the cross. And so when I teach and preach, I talk about the cross. I talk about Jesus on the cross. I talk about how he was resurrected from the cross. In weakness or in strength, he says, with much trembling, my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in the dem demonstration of God's power. I know many of you, if you're like me, have friends, family even, people that you know, people you see all the time. And I want to say our, our methodology of, of decentralizing the church and being missional, all of that is good. I mean, it's representative of, of uh, what the early church was like. I have a feeling, though, if Paul walked into most of our churches, he would be Amazing. Well, what is all this about? Nevertheless, it's not wrong. But if at the end of the day you do not know how to explain something about the resurrection, the gospel, to talk about the facts, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried and he was raised again. Based on eyewitness testimony, the women saw him, the twelve saw him, and then there were 500 that saw him in, in 1 Corinthians 15. And then I was the last one, the least of all the apostles. I saw him. They had eyewitness testimony, but we are witnesses to that testimony, and we believe them. We ascend to those facts. But it's God, the Holy Spirit, that makes the difference. This is God's sovereignty in salvation. What did Paul say? Even the apostle Paul. I planted, right? Silas watered. But God gave the increase. You are not responsible for the increase. Not at all. 
you're not the Holy Spirit. You are not the one who can arm wrestle somebody into the kingdom. You're not the one that hauls them in. That's the, that's the strength of the Holy Spirit. So, how do you begin? I want to tell you a very brief thing about Mother Teresa. I shared this at Carolyn's house the other night when we were studying uh, Francis Chan. Mother Teresa, to the latter part of her life, welcomed uh, some reporters, and she got particularly attached to one of them. And she took him out into her field, her mission field. And to his shock, they looked out, and there were, as far, almost as far as the eye could see, were these lepers. And the reporter said to her, Mother T, Mama T, which is what they called her, Mama T, this is dawning, what are you gonna do? You know what she said? I'm gonna start with this one. 